Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Ilan Stavans. Uh, it is a pleasure to be in this, the second of uh, six events, six uh, uh, conversations that are part of the Point Counterpoint series uh, at Amherst College. Uh, before I introduce our distinguished guests today, I want to say something about the series, about what's coming up, and uh, uh, giving you a sense of the, the lay of the land of where, how this started. Uh, Point Counterpoint is the result of an initiative that involved the faculty, the administration, the students, and the alums at uh, the college. In 2016, when the presidential election was taking place, and the result of that election came as a big shock, not only nationally and internationally, but certainly locally in the microcosm of many small liberal arts colleges and universities, where it became clear that maybe we were not quite synchronized with the rest of the country that uh, we were moving in one direction and the rest of the country certainly just uh, judging from the election was moving in another one. And so uh, the impression was that uh, we were not listening to those that uh, have opinions that are different to ours, that we were canceling them. And that as a result, all of us ideologically in terms of class, uh, race and ethnicity, a religious backgrounds, we were living, we are living in silos. So the Point Counterpoint uh, initiative uh, resulted from uh, a desire to be able to understand those, to th those who think differently from us, uh, those who are outspoken and intelligent and human, and yet see the world in, through a very different lens. Uh, the idea was to bring them and uh, either to put them one um, facing the other, or as I chose to take that route, to be able to allow each individual one to explore uh, their own views and to present them to the entire community. The community is made of students, of uh, faculty and administrators, staff, and the general public. And this is the fourth installment of the Point Counterpoint series that is made possible by the Seminars on Opposing Views Fund established by the members of the class of 1970 with continuing support from individual alumni and parents. This year's theme is politics and poetry. What role does the poet play in culture, in society in general? Why is it that Plato exiled, exiled poets from his Republic? Are poets a messianic voices or are poets a prophets as in the biblical sense who are able to articulate thought that others are unable to and that society often doesn't want to hear, doesn't want to engage in. This, this series is in tandem with a course that I am teaching also called poet, Politics and Poetry, where the work of all the participants in the series is studied carefully, carefully, meticulously, thorough, thoroughly by students and, in, and then the guest comes. Uh, last week we had uh, David Brooks and coming up we have a uh, Joy Arjo, the US Poet Laureate. We have a conversation next week between Jay Perini, the biographer of Robert Frost, and Fred Logeval, the biographer of J.F. Kennedy, and the tortured uh, relationship that they had, particularly at the end of uh, Frost's life, in the last speech that uh, President Kennedy delivered here at Amherst on Tuesday, a movie called The Last, a documentary called The Last Speech, uh, organized by the class of 1964 or sponsored and put together will be shown and on Thursday we're going to have those two speakers and we will also have after that two more speakers in John McWhorter the, so the sociolinguist and we just added a new one uh, on April 29 
uh, Martin Barron, the editor emeritus, editor in chief emeritus of the Washington Post, who also edited the Miami Herald and the Boston Globe, and who is one of the characters in the movie uh, Spotlight uh, about uh, a very important job that uh, Marty Barron and the, and the reporters of the Boston Globe did in uh, exploring and bringing to light the sexual uh, uh, accusations, the sexual abuse of the Catholic Church uh, in, in Boston first and then in, at large. So it is my pleasure and my honor today to have Jerrica Brown, Pulitzer Prize winner, uh, the author of three very important books in a decisive, very influential voice in American poetry. Uh, Jericho was born in 1976 in Shreveport, Louisiana. <laughs> Did I say it already wrong? No. Uh, I, I'm sorry, no. I just never heard anybody say the year I was born in an introduction. So, so much. Going. It it's goes for everybody. <laughs> um, he went to Dillard University, a historically black college, um, and he currently teaches at Emory in Atlanta. Uh, he is the author of the book, Please, 2008, the book, The New Testament, 2014, and the Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Tradition, uh, 2019. Uh, Jericho, I'm, I'm delighted to have you here, and uh, I hope it wasn't, uh, I mean, giving the dates is simply a way of contextualizing. No, it's fine. It's fine. I just didn't expect it. Okay. I, I appreciate it. It's nice to be put in context. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, would, I would like to delve right in, uh, uh, Jericho, into the conversation about the role of the poet, uh, the time in which we live in, in your poetry in particular. Um, can, can I bring you into uh, offering an assessment for all of us of the moment we find ourselves, you find ourself, yourself as, a, as an American poet, African-American, uh, just finishing the four years of the Trump administration in this deep disturbing moment of a, a national conversation on race, where are we? What advances have we made? How have we gone back? How do you see things? Uh, this is a great question and thank you so much for asking me. And also just thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm interested in um, a world where we look to poets to see what they think. So, <laughs> uh, uh, which might be an interesting, an interesting world. Um, right now, I think poets would really just be glad if people read read our poems, but it's nice to say what we think as well. Um, and just in terms of, of where we are, I don't, um, I guess there are two things I'd have to say. The first is that um, there is a, there's a difference between the past and the present, and things are better in the present than they were in the past. Um, I, for instance, I'm not a slave, though I am the descendants of slaves. I'm not a sharecropper, though I am the descendant of sharecroppers. Um, I teach at a predominantly white university, uh, something that might not have been available to me or someone like me or anyone from my family uh, at another time. And that's that as well as um, my poems or, or how I make a living. Um, as you mentioned, I'm a winner of the Pulitzer Prize. so. Uh, and I'm not the, the first or the second black winner of the Pulitzer Prize in poetry. I think there are eight of us now. Um, you know, I wish there were 88 of us, but there are eight of us. So, so things are not where they were. Things are better. That is not to say that things are good. Uh, I like to start with saying that things are better because I get really frustrated with people saying that things are as they have always been. That's, I mean, it's, it really shows that you don't know how things were, if you think things are as they have always been. Um, so think things are better. Um, are things good? No, uh, but I think things are not good because 
of that last piece of the puzzle. And that last piece of the puzzle really just has to do with conversations about race in the United States almost always coming to um, indigenous people, black people, people of color, um, and the expectation that changes are going to be made in a, um, in a faster fashion, given what people of color have to say, when it's actually clear that um, as it relates to race, <laughs> white people don't really seem to listen to people of color. And so I, I think um, what's interesting about this moment, though I'm not, I'm not putting faith in it, but what's interesting about this moment is seeing more um, white people talk to one another about race uh, in the same way that that conversation permeates my life, permeates the life, the lives of black people, of people of color. Um, permeates the ways in which we're raised, uh, the conversations that happen around our di dinner table. Uh, my sense is that those conversations are not happening around the dinner tables of white families. And I think we will really see a difference when that conversation does. And as long as we're avoiding that conversation among white people, we won't. Um, I don't mind answering this question and I'm a person so you know, so I, I'm a person with a race walking around in, in the United States. Um, while race is a construction, I still have that construction on me. Um, but it is interesting to me that I, I go to poetry readings galore. And when I go, go to poetry readings, people ask people of color questions about race. And people neglect asking white people about race. Uh, as if white people don't have a race. Um, when in actuality, if we have trouble with race in our nation, then if we look at the fact of those troubles, if we look at the facts of those troubles, uh, for instance, if we were to look at um, old photographs and postcards of lynchings, all of the people picnicking, enjoying, observing, having a good time at the lynching are white people. <laughs> there are no black people right. in those pictures enjoying the fact of the lynching. Um, and I'm not just talking about the, not the mob, I'm talking about the women right. and the children, the lookers on. Um, and I think there's a way that white people still believe it possible for them to be lookers on and to say that they would like to see change, but you can't have both. You can't say you would like to see change and be a looker on. Uh, I posted something on Twitter recently of, um, in response to uh, the shootings that happened in Atlanta a couple days ago, um, murdering so many women. And, I, and when I posted it right under that, the, the comments were about how afraid of these white people we're saying that they're afraid to talk to other white people about race because white people get violent about race. And the fact of my life is that violence that, people, that white people get violent about race. Yeah. I, I mean, so if you want to know what people of color are going through, they're walking around with that thing that you're afraid to do and they can't run away in fear of doing that. How, how can that conversation of those that are a not not people of color take place in the dinner at the dinner table or in other places how can we get into that a state of mind where being white is accepted as a race instead of the absence of a race that you were speaking of what what changes need to be how how can that transformation take place and or uh, Jericho is the conversation that we are having in institutions, uh, in in on the street, in the restaurants right now, advancing us even very slowly in that direction. You said you said that you that things are better. And might it be that the better is that we're a step closer to that? Maybe I can also ask you. You know, just in the '60s, we were in the middle of a, 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 another transformative a period in American history where people had hope that there would be a dramatic change. And this is 
Uh, 50 years later, and uh, the advance has been very slow. How can that change take place? How can we reach that point? Yeah, I don't, I mean, there are many answers to that question. Um, you know, there's this sort of easy individual answer where one of the things you can do is look at your bookshelf and see who who's on it that's not white. I mean, that's one thing that you could actually do. And then you can be convicted at the fact that everybody on it is white. Like that's mm -hmm. one, I mean, you know, just on an individual level. Um, another thing you can do is imagine um, white movements that have been organized and what those dinner conversations must have been like. What's, what is it like to sit at a dinner table um, with people who are invested in the Proud Boys or invested in the Klan? Um, they don't mind talking about race <laughs> when they're at the dinner table. Maybe if we were to um, begin to imagine those conversations, we can imagine what the opposite would look like. But, and I sort of said it in this last answer, you know, the work that has been done on the behalf of, um, of um, doing something about uh, uh, racial inequity, that work has been done because of organizers and organization. Uh, that work has been done because of um, sociologists and ethnographers. That work has been done because of lawyers. Uh, that work has been done uh, because people got together and opened Dillard University <laughs> where I went to school. Do you know what I mean? So. That kind of thing can only happen via organization. And right now, I mean, I'm sure there are exceptions, but the major organizations that have something to do with solving the problems inherent in race, um, those organizations are always based in people who are not white. Um, when you, and no matter, uh, no matter what movement we're interested in or what movement we complain about, um, all of those movements are happening because people, when people are in the street blocking traffic, somebody planned that. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, just as um, my grandparents planned for me to go to college. Now, I don't, I'm always amazed by that fact, <laughs> but I know it's true. They organized around that before I was born. And if you organize around it, then you can imagine a world where your children or your grandchildren, based on something that you might not be able to see, uh, but that you can create a world, you can set foundation for a house that they will be able to live in. Um, but you have to have an idea of working for it. And it's very difficult, I think, for white people to work around race because they don't understand that they would need to. Uh, white people know sort of, I mean, one of the reasons why we see all these really weird things happen that gets that get caught on camera phones is <laughs> white people have some some sense of this going on in their heads like, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, wait, something's wrong, right? And so and then but they they remain surprised because they're not involved in this in a daily or a weekly or a monthly fashion. Uh, and if they were involved in it, then they wouldn't be surprised by other things. You know, a lot of a lot of white people uh, were surprised when Donald Trump was elected. You mentioned this earlier. Um, I don't know a lot of black people who were surprised by that. Do you know what I mean? But if white people knew black people, maybe they wouldn't have been surprised. <laughs> you know, you, or, or if white people listened to black people, black women in particular, um, organizing black women who work elections, maybe they wouldn't have been surprised. Were you surprised uh, not by the the triumph of the, of the, of Trump, but by how the country changed in those four years, by the the extremes of those changes, or that didn't surprise you either? It seems, at least uh, from a white perspective, and I come from a Mexican Jewish background, being white, that uh, in the four years of the Trump uh, administration. There, there emerged voices that had been in the margins that probably people of, of color had seen before, but for many, they were right there in front of the television, right there in, the, in, in, in people's eyes much more. Were you surprised by what happened in those four years? No, I wasn't. Um, as a matter of fact, I wasn't even surprised by the insurrection. I was heartbroken by the ins insurrection. Uh, one of, uh, but, but no, I wasn't. I don't think I saw anything surprising 
Mm-hmm. Um, I think I really did give up on surprise back when um, I'll say two things. One is I gave up on surprise back when Barack Obama was president and somebody thought to go and shoot a bunch of little kids, little white kids, you know. And when I realized no one was going to do anything about gun control in the, in this country was the moment that I realized, oh, white kids are going in, white people are going into schools and, and killing white kids and nothing's going to really be done to stop that from happening, mm-hmm. which means no more surprise for me. <laughs> you know, like, like, like white people are allowing this to happen to themselves. So, cause I really thought white people wouldn't allow bad things to happen to themselves, but I guess so much for that. Uh, so that's the first thing. And the second thing is, you know, if a lot, and this sort of goes to your first question as well. I think a lot would be solved if we had an idea, you know, it is not, um, it is not insulting, weird, it is not strange to say that there is African-American history in this nation, right? It is not strange to say um, that there is um, Latinx American history, like do you, or Mexican American history, right. do you understand? Or, or Irish American or, do you, or Catholic history in the United States, do you understand what I mean? Um, and I think maybe part of what happens is that when you are not white, you're very aware of the fact that there is a such thing as white history, white American history. And when you are white, you don't know that. And, um, you know, maybe if you understand that there is white history, you can create a, um, a discipline for yourself, a study, and you can go figure out what that white history is. And if you know white history, then you are less and less surprised. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I think it's very difficult. Uh, these these conversations around the di- dinner table, I think, are really difficult. And I say this as a queer person who knows, you know, I have very close friends who understand that they are not in, con- in conversation with their parents because of who they love or who they could love. Do you understand what I mean? So um, when you add race to the mix, people are very aware if I were to say these things around the dim- dinner table, I could end up homeless. <laughs> or I could, do, which is you know, why it's important to become an independent person in the world if you can. Um, so I get it. Uh, at the same time, I think part of what people do is they make excuses for folks because they're related to folks or they know folks or they know the good in folks. Um, but knowing the good in people doesn't stop those people from creating policies that end up murdering other folk. Do you think, Jericho, that uh, that the concept of America as a nation, you write it in a poem that you published the inaugural in, 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 on January, January 20th. Do you think that the concept of America as a nation with this very push and pull movements that are taking place, with the fact that people from different ideological uh, persuasions are moving out of neighborhoods in order to live only with themselves or racially we're reverting some of the patterns that we had of integration. Do you think the concept of being all together have a common good, have a sense that the nation, the dream of the nation can still be there? Do you as a poet, as a poet would play that plays with words and that uses words to go incisively into the the moment in which we live, it's still current, or is it falling apart before our eyes? That that uh, that this is not that 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 we are being fractured much more dramatically than we want to confess, that we want to recognize. Well, I I don't. I mean, I think the answer to that question is pretty evident. I mean, I don't. I'll just say that we experienced a coup. <laughs> like I don't know if everybody. At, at the moment that people were counting votes, someone let a bunch of folk in who also had bombs around the Capitol. And those people went in those buildings to beat up or murder the people who were counting votes. So I'm not, I don't, I mean, and they were, they were encouraged to do, those people were encouraged. The insurrectionists were encouraged to do that. So that possibility is, I mean, that possible, because that happened or almost happened, I think that tells us exactly where we really are. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, that's all. Th this are, these are uh, four lines of that beautiful poem that you wrote, uh, inaugural, uh, an original poem. We imagine an impossible America and call one another a fool for doing so. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be hopeful if it means I've got to be naive. Mm -hmm. uh, where then shall we put our pain when we want rest? Uh, and if no one's punishment leads to my salvation, then accountability is what waits. That particular last line. Um, maybe I got from your answer, uh, Jericho, that we are naive, uh, that, we're, that we're persistent on seeing this. I will go to that last line. If no one's punishment leads to my salvation, uh, salvation then accountability is what waits. Um, what kind of uh, accountability? Tell me more about that line. Explain it to me. It's a line that students were puzzled by um, the words punishment and the word accountability. Uh, having read a lot of your poetry before, I'd love to hear your reflections on it, particularly as it fits into January 20th, the beginning of for better or worse, a different era, if not a better era. Yeah, I, um, you know, your students are probably puzzled by those moments in the poem because they're abstractions. And uh, I try not to <laughs> deal in abstractions as a poet. I try to stay as concrete as possible. Uh, that poem, Inaugural, is a poem that I look forward to seeing in a book one day in a very different version. Uh, if it wasn't mm -hmm. a poem that I had written with a deadline, maybe it wouldn't have those abstractions in those moments where it, where it has them. Um, as it is though, um, I just, I would like for us to talk the talk and walk the walk uh, if we're interested in doing something that bridges a supposed racial divide. I would like for us to notice that there is no mechanism in this nation for anyone to learn anything about race. There is no mechanism. Um, there might be a mechanism in this nation whereby you learn history um, through going to school, but even then there is no conversation about race. As a matter of fact, if you go to the schools that I grew up on, uh, what's being stressed about race is that everybody white didn't own slaves or that there were good slave masters, which is an obvious <laughs> oxymoron. Um, so, so, um, I, I think part of what I mean is, um, and, and I think part of where people go wrong is people have this idea that, um, white people are being asked to flay themselves or to somehow be punished. Um, and I don't think anybody's, I don't think anybody's asking for that. I think what we're asking for is that everybody move forward on the same knowledge base. And we're operating on several sets of knowledge um, and that there's knowledge out there that just isn't real. And we've been, some of us have been told that in order for us to be able to wake up in the morning and go to bed at night. Uh, and we need to figure out if we knew the truth, how would we wake up in the morning? How would we go to bed at night? Uh, one of the ways that we survive in this nation is our naive, our naivete. Like that actually, uh, helps us go on um, thinking about things like hope, which, um, <clears throat> you know, the Afro pessimists think are absolutely ridiculous. Uh, but I'm a person who thinks that if I am not, uh, and maybe I secretly am, but if I am not involved in an active revolutionary movement, then I can shut up about not having hope. Do you understand what I mean? Um, I mean, we have our options. Um, you can have hope understanding that you need to temper that hope such that you are not naive, mm -hmm. or you can understand this is crazy. Um, capitalism is a mess. Whiteness is a mess. Do you, and you can get yourself involved in certain kinds of revolutionary action that might land you in prison. Um, and those are really, I mean, if, I mean, to be honest with you, those are really our options. Um, and while I am a person who is very clearly interested in revolutionary acts, I am not willing uh, to do the kinds of things 
that would outright do, uh, overthrow the government by myself in this moment. Do you know what I mean? I don't want to go to prison right now. You understand? Okay. What I'm Absolutely. The fact that I know the system doesn't work. It doesn't, I mean, it's not working, Ilan. Connect, connect revolution with poetry or poetry with revolution, uh, Jericho. And I want to I want to stop at something that you said because for some of the members of the audience, there will be a resonance that you, because you were not here last time, um, might not know. And that is that uh, I was talking with the David Brooks and he was mentioning how he puts together some of the columns that he writes. He writes methodically, systematically, uh, once a week, submitting a piece to the Times and another piece to the Atlantic, uh, uh, the magazine, and how he puts it all together. And in the end, in, based on what I know about how you put together your poems, they are not that different. Um, and I'll, I'll go there in a second, but, but he works on deadline. And you just said, Jerrica, that, that the fact that you had a deadline for this, that poets, poets don't have deadlines. Talk to me about deadlines. Well, sometimes we have deadlines if, you know, if our editor says there's a chance you might arrive inaugural poem so we need you to write an inaugural poem and if you do it we might be able to get it in the New York Times do you know what I, mean? I mean that causes a, a I had another New York Times a deadline uh, in the summer I wrote a poem called the summer of 2020 I wrote a poem called say thank you say I'm sorry uh, which I was assigned to do and that had a deadline so poems do happen on deadline I do not expect the poems that happen on deadline to be the poet's greatest work. Uh, I think in, in one case with that poem, say, thank you, say, I'm sorry, I'm much more pleased. And in the other case, I wish I had had more time uh, and I would, I would work on it more. Uh, when I'm writing my poems, I am, and one of the reasons I think of writing as a re revolutionary act is that when I'm writing my poems, I am quite literally following where language takes me and allowing language to take me into meaning, as opposed to coming to the poem with the things I want to say. I do not sit down thinking, I want to write a poem about X. I do not, I definitely don't sit down thinking, I want to write a poem about the time I blank. That's not how it gets done. It gets done through a process of really following sounds, um, listening to language for its music, and I'm sort of making a score of music based on those sounds, a, a composition. And then when I look at that, I try to rev I revise that mess because originally it's just a mess of music, right? I revise that mess toward meaning. Uh, and that way I can work with the language I have to figure out what it is I might want to say. And I'm working then with my unconscious and my subconscious rather than the Jericho. And that's what allows me to say things that I don't expect to say. And that's what allows me to say things in my poems where I'm hard on myself. And when you, two questions in, in, in reaction to that, Jerrica, you were talking before about not being surprised by where the country is. But are you surprised when you write a poem at where the poem is taking you? And what do you do with that surprise or with that sense of having been taken by the music, having been taken, taken by the meaning into a new territory that you were that you were just allowing to go. No, that's question number one. And question number two is revision. Um, it seems to me that when, when I read the interviews that you've given, when I read the poems that you end up producing and that are in a book, meaning to me that they are already canonized, you, are, you want them to be this way. The book is what you're giving, not the newspaper. Um, how and when do you know that revision is is finished, that revision is there, that you have found the, mu the final music or the final shape of the poem, and not that you can continue the way Wild Whitman would go even after the book was published, revising the poem time and again, and maybe dead, death is the only final draft of a poem because you cannot change anything anymore. Well, I have something, um, you know, Whitman had in a small amount, I mean, Whitman and Dickinson both had in, in some small amount uh, in comparison to the amount that I have. I have community. I have friends. I have poets. Uh, and poets, the poetry community uh, is still the best artist community around because you can call your, your poet friend at three o'clock in the morning and say, I think I got something. 
and uh, he or she will roll over. They will roll over from their spouse <laughs> and say, let me hear what you got. So, <laughs> uh, you know, your violinist friends can't do that. And your sculptor friends can't either. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I friends and my friends tell me to leave something alone or they tell me it's done or they tell me it's great or they tell me you need to go back to it. Now, I'm not going to remember... So that's one way that I know things are done is because you I'm listen to community. others. You listen to those that are close to you. And you know, the community. The community doesn't just happen in the present tense. It happens in the past tense as well. I have ancestors. I have Gwendolyn Brooks. I have Audre Lorde. I have Adrian Rich. I have all of these poems um, to read that give me ideas about how to end, how to get to an ending, how to begin, how to handle the middle of a poem. Uh, so I'm not doing this alone people are standing with me when i'm writing my poems can you remind me of the first question though because i don't remember it the other question is now let's see if i if i remember this oh, i think i remember it yeah. so so here the here's the thing <clears throat> when i'm writing because of the way i write it's counter culture because the culture would have us not be vulnerable and not be intimate everything about our culture particularly if you're a man tells you, do not, whatever you do, be vulnerable. And do not, whatever you do, get intimate. But if you're writing in a way where you're going to allow the language to lead you, you don't know where you're going to end up, right? We're told all day, every day to have a plan. Do you know what I'm saying? I don't have a plan when I'm writing a poem. As a matter of fact, I, I understand that the poem is much better when I'm surprised by it. When I'm surprised by it, it can do work on me, right? Um, I have been something that I can read that it literally came out of my body. And I say to it, wait, do I think that? I wrote that. Do I, is that what I believe? That gives me, and that becomes a catalyst for change, right? Because then I have to say, well, if that's what I think, I need to start to live that way. Do you mm -hmm. understand what I mean? So, and this is... This is my experience writing poetry and also why I love reading poetry. Um, my love for poems have to, has to do with the fact that they, they convict me. They have me stand up. Um, they ask me to see beauty and to say that it is worthy, that beauty is worthwhile and valuable. Um, whenever you take something that it's hard for other people to put a price tag on and you say it is valuable, then you are doing counterculture work. Yes. Yeah. Did you did you start as a poet that way? Is this a method or an approach that you that age has brought you an experience in the in the carving of the previous poems? Um, I am assuming because I heard you say in in interviews about how the voice that you had as a poet was celebrated at home and that you you could you could feel secure in that take took you places but this idea that you reach a certain level of surprise and that you don't know where you're going you you mentioned correct me here Jerka, because in no way do i want it was it's a beautiful thought that you took certain lines from book one or book two and then you played with them and and rearranged them that lines can be excerpted from a poem and then become something else later. Is this something that you have processed over the years? How did you come to this approach? Yeah, I wouldn't take lines from a book. I take lines, uh, many of the poems that I write, um, definitely most of the, a good deal of the tradition happened because I was writing whole poems or I could remember, and I don't know why, and this is a whole nother story, uh, which you're, I guess, familiar with, having read about how this book came together, um, I could remember snippets and snatches from other poems or from other drafts of poems, and I would come home and try to find them. And then I could push from those snippets or snatches, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or I could take um, lines in poems that were great lines, but failed poems. So let's say I have 10 poems. I mean, I'm writing poems all the time. I think people think People don't understand that because I'm writing, when you see a book, what you're seeing is what I let you see. It's like the pictures I take on Instagram. You know, <laughs> I don't take, everybody's like, you take good pictures. No, I, I pick the pictures for you to see. <laughs> you think I take good pictures. Right. Um, 
So you, what you do, what I do is I, I might take 10 poems written between the year 2000 and 2020 that have failed. They're sitting on the computer and I haven't used them. But there's, they couldn't be failures because they have to have, in each of them, there's at least one line. Mm -hmm. So if there's one line in, in 10 poems, I take those 10 lines from 10 different places and I begin reorganizing them mm -hmm. on the page and they start to speak to each other, right? And so I find out that this poem in 2001 didn't work because it needed a poem from 2012 and it didn't know that it needed it. And, and that poem didn't work because I had an experience in 2013 that I hadn't had, although I had written lines toward that experience. You understand so, what I'm so in some ways, the poems that you're writing right now will not be finished until something that happens in 10 years from now. And, and they are, these poems become contemporaneous to one another and kind of erase time as well until you decide that the poem is going to come out. Yes, these poems are, they are the new thought movement. <laughs> now talk to me, Jerry. Talk to me about a form. You play with form constantly, poetic form, the sonnet, the gazal. In in the tradition, you play with the duplex, the repeating sentences in in the in this in the in the different stanzas. And um, I'd love for you to meditate out loud in front of all of us on the freedom that one has when one doesn't have full freedom because the form is there or because the form is there, one has full freedom. Anything, freedom and form in poetry. Yeah, well, you know, I'm sort of going back and forth with my students about this right now, actually. Uh, they get frustrated because I asked them to do a formal thing. Um, and I have a way of asking, Emory students are, um, they're very smart and they're very ambitious. And so if you sort of show them something and say, oh, you might want to try that, then they, they feel like they feel like you beat them with, I mean, it's worse than giving them, it. if you were to give them an assignment, they would just do it. But if you say, oh, you might want to try that, they think, what kind of challenge is that? Oh my God, I really got to do it now. I don't know, maybe you could do that. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but it, of course they get frustrated working in, uh, working in form uh, because they want to know everything. And I write such that I don't know everything. I want to find something out. I'm writing to investigate and discover. So the wonderful thing for me about form is that let's say a form calls for a rhyme, as, as many forms do. If a form calls for a rhyme, then I know at some point after I say a word like yellow at the end of a line, I'm going to have to rhyme that with a word and I'm coming to it, right? So that's exciting for me because that means I get to use a word I did not expect to use and I get to see what I think about that word. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what I thought about that word. The only word right now that I can think that rhymes with yellow is mellow, which is a word nobody uses anymore. But wouldn't it be exciting in the middle of a poem to realize I have to say mellow? How am I going to get away with that? What am I going to do? Do you understand what I'm... And for me, that's why... I mean, I love that. That's why I'm a poet. That's the joy. The joy for me is that I'm going to learn something new uh, because I use a word that I don't already use. And because there might be certain words out there that are of fashion or that are not being seen like mellow, are not being seen a, a culturally in a, in a cool way, in that by taking them, by incorporating them, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll do something with them that is, that is different. Yeah, you? exactly. Yeah. Now, I, I, there's, a, there's a poem in the tradition, uh, in the book, The Tradition, the one that won the Pulitzer, that is called Dark, uh, and it starts like this. I am sick of your sadness, Jerrica Brown, your blackness, your books, sick of your lying me down so I forget how sick I am. Uh, talk to me about that poem, sick of, and, and it's, it's kind of in the, in the second person. Uh, yeah, it's funny. Um, you want me to tell you the page? It's uh, page 67. <laughs> yeah, 
67. I am sick of your sadness, Jericho Brown, your blackness, your book, sick of you laying me down so I forget how sick I am. I'm sick of your good looks. I think that's hilarious. Uh, but you know, I'm telling the joke, so maybe it's your debates, your concern, your determination to keep your butt plump, the little money you earn. Yeah, I'm sick of that. Um, I'm sick of you saying no when yes is as easy as a young man, bored with you saying yes to every request, though you're as tired as anyone else yet consumed with a single diagnosis of health. I'm sick of your hurting. I see that you're blue. You may be ugly, but that ain't new. <laughs> Everyone you know is just as cracked. Everyone you love is, is as dark or at least as black. Yeah, um, I think one of, the, one of the things that this book allowed me to do with this poem and, and maybe a couple other poems as well is uh, tap into humor in ways that I hadn't been able to tap into earlier, definitely in the third section of the book. I wanted things to lighten up in a certain way. Um, I wanted there to be, you know, Plato talks about um, uh, that, that poetry is to, uh, to teach and delight. Uh, and so I'm interested in that delight part of, of what poetry can do uh, in this particular poem. And, but, but is, go ahead, go ahead. And I'm interested in a poem in which I'm talking to myself directly. Um, I mean, I really do get sick of those things about myself. <laughs> I got, that's, the, that's the question that I wanted to ask you. Do, do you get sick of those things? Do you get sick of yourself? Do you see, get sick of the image that others, us, see of you, that want to see of you? And what do you do with that sickness? Yeah, I don't know about getting sick of the image that others see of me, because um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what that. <laughs> I don't know what that image uh, is. Um, I don't know what that image entails. But now that I'm thinking about it, it's exciting to me. I'm like, what do people see? So <laughs> like, I, now I'm stuck in line. Anyway, <laughs> um, but but yeah, you know how you you have your daily frustrations. And then sometimes you look at those frustrations and you think, what am I complaining about? Do you know what I mean? So that's part of what, that's part of what I think I'm trying to get at in, in the poem. Um, and then, you know, a lot of this, a lot of this book uh, is really interested in, um, in blackness and race. And a lot of this book is really interested in delineating between the two. You know, if I write a poem about being black or write a poem about blackness, um, that is not a poem about race. Uh, as a matter of fact, every poem I write will be black. Uh, yeah. That doesn't mean every poem I write is a poem about race. Uh, and, I, and, and part of what this poem is about is, is blackness, I guess, and being in a community. Uh, what does it mean to be sick of yourself when you're in a community of black folks? So. <laughs> I've seen you talk about, a, or I've read you talk, about uh, other poets that uh, and other writers that mean to you. You have mentioned a few of them, Adrian Rich, you talk about Robert Bly, uh, but you talk in um, different places that I've seen, Jericho, about uh, Langston Hughes, the impact that Langston Hughes had on you. And if I remember correctly, but please correct me if I don't have it right, uh, at some point feeling like some of us from Latin America felt for Borges that uh, Langston Hughes was too much of a presence in you and that, uh, that you needed to, maybe in your second book, find some sort of distance in order to find your own voice. Um, I'd love for you to, to meditate on, on uh, you know, who, who Langston Hughes is for you and, and on influence, on influence, uh, finding one's place vis-a-vis -vis those writers that you still go back when you find that community, when you need that community to see how to, how to end the poem or how to feel that something, the rhythm is right. Uh, Langston Hughes, a, a poet that I adore, it must be up there in that community in some ways, or maybe you're, you have distanced him in some ways. Um, let me hear. Yeah, when I was a kid, um, I've read a lot of poems, a lot of books of poetry. And when I say that, um, I mean, I was reading, I had read, by the time I was eight, nine, 10 years old, I had read Leaves of Grass, I'd read Ariel by Sylvia Plath. I know I had read, um, I must have read, I must have read Life Studies. I know I read a low book and it must have been Life Studies now that I think about it. Um, I had read Life Studies, I had read and hadn't liked um, some Frank O'Hara. So I was reading a lot of what then was thought of as contemporary poetry. I read Rita Dove, 
Uh, but I was also reading, because I was reading what the librarians gave me, I was reading um, poems from the 19th century, uh, Whitman, uh, Dickinson, um, and poems from the Harlem Renaissance. Um, I read a, a good deal of Claude McKay, County Cullen, and yes, of course, uh, Langston Hughes. And uh, I just fell in love with him. And part of the reason why I fell in love with him, and part of the reason I still love him, is because I could not figure out what he was doing. And I didn't have, even at the age of 10, I had an idea and I, I, I still, uh, I'm sort of proud of myself about that. I still think I'm right. Do you know what I mean? Um, you know, I, I'll never forget the first time I read um, Anne Sexton's Wanting to Die. There's a poem by Anne Sexton called uh, Wanting to Die. Um, and it, it begins something like, since you ask, most days I cannot remember. Right, which is, I think, a beautiful line. But I sort of see the trick, it's since you ask. And as a reader, I'm drawn in in that moment. Uh, with Hughes, I could never understand why I was crying. Uh, to this day, I could never understand why I was moved other than that I was, do you know what I mean? Um, he has a poem called My People, and the last line is, beautiful are the souls of my people. Why is that so good? <laughs> Do you, know, do you know what I mean? Um, or uh, Suicide's Note. Suicide's Note in, in uh, the, um, the Suicide's Note. The calm, cool face of the water asked me for a kiss. And it's just great. Do you know that's very good? It's three lines. Yeah. You know I mean? The Suicide's Note. Obviously, you need the title. Suicide's note. The calm, cool face of the of the river. The calm, cool face of the river asked me for a kiss. Oh, it's almost like a fantastic short story. Yeah. Exactly. So I understood when I was very young that poem. I mean, there were other, particularly the short lyric poems. I would love to be able one day to do a selected of, of Langston Hughes's short lyric poems. But there, I, I was really taken aback with trying to figure out what was happening and I still have that love for him and that's the thing and I think you know maybe that's you know Langston Hughes would say that's the blues mm -hmm. and, you know we know some other folk would say that's doing that <laughs> right? so and but that thing is the thing that I have been chasing after as a reader and writer of poetry since I was a kid and, and do you hear echoes of Hughes in your most recent work still or have you overcome Hughes because of that uh, push and pull that you had with him at some point? I think, um, well, I don't know if I had, I mean, you're saying I said this, so if I said it, I said it. I don't, but I don't remember. I mean, you know, it's been a long time. I don't remember <laughs> push and pull. I do remember thinking, I mean, I sort of do have this feeling about Langston Hughes being a poet uh, that you adore. And as with any poet you adore, uh, you're also trying to throw them off your back because you want to individualize and distinguish yourself. Um, and so I do think that's true about Langston Hughes. I don't know if I sound like him, but I do think that I can get at certain moments of the sublime mm -hmm. in the, through things that I've learned from reading him. Sure, uh, okay. I, Tyree Day sounds more like the best of Langston Hughes than I do. I mean, even Dustin Pearson in some ways begins to sound like that. Like, it's interesting to me uh, when I think about descendants of Langston Hughes. Langston Hughes was very much, I mean, some would say he was a DC poet, but I think he was very much a Harlem poet. Mm -hmm. and, um, and some would actually say he was a Midwestern poet. But the poets who um, really get him in their work seem to me poets from the South. You know, Miscegenation by, um, that last line, Miscegenation by um, Natasha Trethway, that poem, the last line of that poem is, that's a Langston Hughes line. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? The, the rest of the poem is, I mean, it's infused with the knowing of Hughes. Yeah. In history. Yeah. Beautiful. I have two questions, uh, Jericho, as we come to the very end. Uh, one of them is that uh, uh, you, ch you chose your name. Yeah. You chose to be Jericho Brown. Yeah. I, um, I started publishing poems under the name Nelson DeMarie the Third, which is my birth is my birth name my birth name birth name. You know, I have these two other people in the world who had that exact same name except for the third part, and I would I would like write a poem about my dad, and then the poem 
would come out and I would feel like, oh, wow, I got a poem to come out. And then I would open him like, and his name's on it. <laughs> and I wanted my poems to be mine. Yeah. So um, that had so, a lot of so finding a name was a way, but but Jerry Brown, what how 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 did you come to that name? I dreamed it. I dreamed I was in a waiting room and the 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 receptionist asked for Jericho and Jericho wasn't getting up and I really wanted to get beyond the door behind uh, the receptionist. So I pretended to be Jericho and then I woke up and that's how I oh, that's I how it. I came up with it. Yeah. I don't know if I would have, you know, now I don't know, but as a young person, it seemed very important to me. I'll never forget this. As a young person, it was very important to me to change my name and become that person, right? I had this idea that there was a Jericho Brown and that's who I needed to be. And I could reinvent and create myself um, having created that name. And you became Jericho Brown through your poetry. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think I would have become Jericho Brown if I wasn't a poet. I also wouldn't be on social media if I wasn't a poet, so there's that. But but I really did, um, I wanted to be the poet named Jericho Brown. I'm still working on it, you know? I mean, in many ways I've, I've become that guy, but I'm still working on it. Yeah. And, and let's go back to the very beginning, Jericho, and I've enjoyed this enormously. Um, the importance of, of the, the poet in, a, in, in this very many, maybe not very surprising time in American history. Uh, what a poet could say, what a poet can do, what a poet can subvert that nobody else can do. Uh, thoughts on that? Thoughts on the role of poetry now? Uh, the, the marginal yet very central role of poetry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think what's wonderful about poems is that they work on individuals. Uh, one of the reasons why they're difficult to market in a capitalist kind of a way is because it go, they go from one heart to another. Somehow or another, there are many copies of the tradition, but it's not like many copies of, I don't know, Beyonce's latest album. Do you know what I mean? It's not for masses, though masses might get a hold of the book. When someone reads the tradition, it's between me and that one. And uh, I think that puts us in a kind of communion that we don't get to be in otherwise. And poems tell the truth. And often uh, when we find ourselves in communion, that ends up being what we're missing. Uh, and so what it allows for is a one-on-one -on -one conversation I mean, you feel this reading poems, that someone's speaking to you directly, a one-on-one -on -one conversation in which you know nobody's going to try to lie to you. And that, you know, that's a dream, man. That's a dream, a one-on-one -on -one conversation where nobody tries to lie to you. That's what poems are giving us right now. And I'm grateful. Um, I have to say this because I really haven't had a chance to say it publicly, and I know we're running out of time. But I want to say... Um, I am really grateful to all the poets who have been writing and working so hard and doing Zoom after Zoom um, during the pandemic. Uh, the world, when it is on fire, always leans on us, you know? Uh, people don't realize how much they need poems till they need poems. Uh, people don't realize how much poems have been sustaining their lives the whole time they were not in crisis, right? Uh, and so I'm grateful to the poets for being there for me and grateful to people for allowing us to do our work on them during this time period. Terrific, really a pleasure to hear you and to Thank get you. to know you, um, an honor. Uh, muchas gracias. I should be the one to say I'm honored, man. You're so famous, this is great. It's I was really... calling my friend Michael. He was like, you're being interviewed by who? Do you know who that is? <laughs> this is great. I really appreciate it. Thank I you. I am I'm humbled. Really, thank you very much. And it was wonderful. Thank you. I'll see you later. We'll shake hands. We will at some point soon. <laughs>